asked with a flirty smile before turning toward Mia with a particular glare. Scoosh over, Mia Corva. Give our guests some room to relax. Which news network would you suggest then? The slightly shorter but much thinner woman shot the man a confused look after sliding over to give him room. According to statistical analysis, this is the most watched program in your system. They manipulate those stats. The man explained, while hopping over the back of the couch and landing between the two tall women. It's common policy for all major core and governments to have this channel playing in the background in their lobbies and break areas. So, technically, it is on the most screens. But if you want real news, go to Pirate News, 42069. Pirate? Hervia had an almost offended look on her face. Yeah. But it's not what you're thinking. Mick replied as he got comfortable and spread his arms along the back of the couch that was just a bit too big for him. The name comes from the old idea of hijacking broadcast frequencies to circumvent government censorship and also funny numbers. Why would numbers be Mia began to question before Hervria interrupted her. You expect us to believe that self-labeled pirates are more trustworthy than official news sources? The hesitation and doubt were quite clear in both the sub-admiral's expression and voice. 420 is the weed number, and 69 is the sex number. Answering the smaller, but still large woman's query first, he saw her freckles light up, while she quickly moved her hand to cover the giggling smile that appeared on her face. Turning back toward the larger of the two women, Mick continued, and if it helps, they started out as a parody news network making fun of the way real news was always biased in their coverage. But over time, shit got so absurd that there was no parody that could be more extreme. They just sorta became real news with investigative journalists and everything. Hammer? Akshika called out from her lounge. Let's see what this pirate news is. Yes, ma'am, one moment, please. The voice of the Hammer's AI responded as the screen went black for a moment before switching to a new, far more interesting scene. Instead of the limited framing and expensive aesthetic contrasting against in plain outdoor environment featured in the Elm broadcast, this wide shot showed a fairly casually dressed woman with rainbow hair comfortably seated across from a woman with rain, two long dark braids, and wearing advanced combat armor similar to ten suit. The angle and focus of the camera ensured that several mechanized walkers were visible in frame through the large glass window behind the pair of women. Between them resting on a small table sat a device which was acting as both microphone for the interview as well as a translator to ensure proper context was imparted for both the participants and the audience. Text scrolling at the bottom feed was also actively converting the conversation to a few commonly spoken languages, though it was clear their interview had already begun. The scrolling text seemed to indicate the women were only just moving past the initial formalities. Hey, that's wish. Tense blurted out, while jutting a finger towards the woman in combat armor before the room fell quiet to listen to the conversation playing out on their screen. Well, Cherry, as you can probably guess, the situation is fairly complicated at the moment. The Nishnabe woman's voice was simultaneously pleasant and uncertain as they began. At first, our elders were very much of the mindset that Earth and Saul's government or should I say governments, should be negotiated with on equitable terms. However, the amount of galactic laws being broken here are just... She shook her head as her voice trailed off for a moment. Galactic laws such as... 
the interviewer quickly asked. The biggest one would be regulations regarding semi and quasi-sentient autonomous combat AID duel, which seemed to wince slightly as she responded. Mazer, the fully sapient AI who made the first contact address to humanity here in Saul, is one of the foremost experts on those kinds of combat systems. And while they are deeply appalled by your corporations and government's abuses of such precarious systems, and is that what prompted the initial strike on this facility? A neo-Yell law on this facility? Cherry continued her questions while taking notes on a pad of paper. Oh no, that wasn't actually us. There was a slight smile and laugh as this explanation began. That was a rescue mission carried out by the first independent fleet of the third Quistar matriarchy at the request of a protected individual. I can't get into too many details, however, I can say this. I am incredibly impressed by the fact they secured this facility for us without the loss of a single life or any major injuries. I believe the only medical assistance that was required came from an individual who tripped and bumped their head during the initial panic. Fascinating. The rainbow-haired reporter continued to take notes as they spoke. Though I must admit, seeing the leaked footage of the event, it's hard to believe no one was hurt. What kind of weapon systems were utilized to cause so much damage, so precisely? Again, I can't get into many details about specifics. The slight hesitation from that question was quickly followed up by a more enthusiastic addition. However, I can tell you that information regarding such systems could be found on our web. If you know how to look, of course. Speaking of your web, I was surprised to see so much information about your people's post-abduction history available. Regardless of her casual appearance, Cherry was maintaining the tone and an expression of a consummate professional. Despite the introduction of technologies we have yet to develop here on Earth, it seems your culture has remained surprisingly recognizable over the past 12 to 100 years or so. Your language is even intelligible to some members of what we refer to today as the Algic language family. How have your people been able to accomplish this? Hmm. That's an interesting question. And I'm not sure I really have an answer for that. Wish had to stop and think for a moment before continuing. But if I had to guess, I'd say it's because no one ever tried to force anything on us. Our friends educated us on science and industry, but they never tried to change who we were. If anything, they just encouraged us to be our best selves. That's beautiful. A smile crept across the interviewer's face as she paused to ponder for a moment. But when you say friends, do you mean aliens? We don't really use that term anymore. For the other sapient species who live with us on Shkag Piwen. Though the correction was direct, it was also considerate in tone. They are our neighbors, friends, and sometimes family. But yes, to answer your question, it was non-human people who provided education and resources before we were able to become self-sufficient. Have any of these non-human people accompanied you on your return to Earth? And if so, could they join us for this or a future interview? There was a quite excited look on Cherry's face for a moment before she added, Or, if not, could you at least describe them for our audience? We probably won't feel safe bringing them down Earth anytime soon, but that has more to do with proper accommodations. Though there seemed to be a hint of sadness in that answer, and both disappointment and mild confusion from the interviewer, which continued with a much brighter inflection in her voice. Our first friends were the Kiamayik, or, as we called them at the time, Jijadzimek. 
and they were there with us from the very beginning. They could be physically described as vaguely beaver-like, though, after looking through some examples of similar animals on your internet, I'd say they have physical aspects of beavers, otters, and capybara. The Nishnabe woman's smile grew wide while she thought about her friends from other species. And of course, then there's many high cough. They could be described as large, semi-bipedal bears with two lower and four upper appendages. They've been a part of our communities for nearly 1,000 years now. But we also have several croak, both Anare and Coco. A few Penedon families save how many different sentient species live among your people. The reporter couldn't help but blurt out in shock. On our orbital stations, there are individuals from nearly a dozen different species with permanent residence. The Nishnabe woman's reply was accompanied by a wide smile. However, Shkegpoen is categorized as a death world, so very few actually regularly live with us on the planet itself. Death world. Cherry was clearly taken aback by that. Death world is just a planetary classification. It usually implies high to extreme gravity, hyper-competitive ecosystems, extreme weather or geological events, that sort of stuff. There was a clearly dismissive tone as Wish tried to wave away the other woman's concerns. And Shegpawin is only a category 16 death world. Earth, on the other hand, is actually a category 18, basically as bad as it can get, while still being vaguely habitable. I'm sorry, what? The reporter could barely contain herself now. Uh, and yeah. Uh, Mia's voice had hints of flirtiness to it as she spoke through the holographic communication system. How are you and your family doing? Oi, Mia. Good to see ya. Though the Scotswoman's voice wasn't quite as flirty, she did have a coy smirk on her face. The hologram of the redhead turned around to look back as she called out to her brother. Say hi to Mia Johnny. Hi, Mia. A grown man's voice shouted out through the communicator, with a childlike tone before more quietly adding, Oh, she's pretty. Shush. The ginger made a face towards her brother. Mia couldn't see before the hologram floating above the tablet turned back around. That's my little brother Johnny. But we're doing great. They got my ma in surgery right now. And they said she'll be able to start physical therapy in a few days. Mazer even made a mod for Johnny's game so he can learn Nishnabiwan while he plays. That's wonderful. Mia Korva switched her flirtiness from her voice to eyes out of respect as she continued. So, you are still planning on going to Shkegpiwen? With Nishnab now, officially in control of the first contact situation in the Sol system, the Hammer and her crew had been relieved of their immediate official duties, though the flagship of the first of the third of had been asked to stay in the system for at least another week to provide technical assistance. Mia Korva was no longer acting in her official role as a diplomatic officer. Despite the lack of appropriate dock to link up to, the not entirely peaceful situation in the system, and the potentially they may need to be activated again, many of Quizdar officers had started to treat this a short port leave before the end of their four-year deployment. Not knowing what the future would hold, or she would get a chance to come back to the system again, Mia felt she had to at least try to shoot her shot while the opportunity was present. Well, my ma couldn't say no to at least visiting a space station with an orbital garden. Sarah's voice had a hint of playful laughter to it. Quick, quickly shooting a look back at her brother, 
Then returning to the communicator, she continued with a wide smile, but after she sees how they run their show, I don't think she'll want to leave. I'm so happy to hear that. The smile on the Quiztar's face spread past her tusks and created small wrinkles next to crimson eyes. Both the station and planet are absolutely beautiful. And the Nishnab are so welcoming that you all should feel right at home in no time. But I have to ask, do you have any other plans for the more immediate future? Why, yeah, asking, huh? The reply was stoic, just long enough for me as freckles to light up before Sarah's smile returned with a wink. But nah, not really. All I know is I ain't going back to Ani. But I may eventually go back to Uni. Uni? Oh, University. Mia replied as the translator caught up to the context. Ye. I never finished my degree. Sarah chuckled at her own little joke. That shite with Mick happened while I was in my final semester, so I never got to finish my capstone. Speaking of, there was hesitation in the quiz tar's voice before she was cut off. All on one set A. The hologram's head turned back a final time as the ginger called out. Oi, Johnny, I'll be right back. As Sarah turned back to her communicator, it looked like she was in the process of standing up and walking somewhere for a few seconds before becoming still again. I'm back. Sorry about that. I just don't really want to talk about Mick in front of I mean, it's... Anyways, what were you going to ask? I... I was going to ask if... Mia kept pausing while she struggled to get anything out, which caused Sarah's smile to grow ear to ear. Spit it out, lass. The giggly, sarcastic tone was just the encouragement that was needed. I was going to ask two questions. The first was if you and Mick, well, you know. Though Mia Corva was finally able to get something out, she still wasn't sure how to properly phrase her questions. A. Nah. I think we're on good terms again, but nothing romantic. Sarah's smile shrunk just slightly as she shrugged off the explanation. But if I'm being totally honest, I'm actually a little mad at the fucker for not telling me everything sooner. Oh, I'm... Uh. There was an almost disappointed look on the quiz tar's face. Well, I guess that kinda answers my second question then. Which was? The reply came with an expression of amused confusion. If your culture allowed for polyamory. There was a moment of silence as Sarah's eyes grew wide and cheek grew red. Almost in a panic, Mia tried to explain. In my species, males only make up a relatively small portion of our population. Usually between 20 to 30 percent. So, it's fairly common for people to form polyamorous relationships. I was just wondering if, before she could finish, Sarah cut her off. Okay. We really, really can't let Mick find out about that. Though the deeply embarrassed expression was slowly calming down, it was clear the ginger was still flustered. Polyamory, polygamy, whatever. It's a thing some people are into, not a big deal. As long as everyone is a happy, consenting adult, it's all good. But if that horny bastard finds out you Amazonians are into that kind of stuff, he's gonna try to build a fucking harem. What's an Amazonian? Mia couldn't help but ask with a curious smile. Large, strong women. It's... Sarah cut herself as she slapped her palm to her face. It's a long story. But 
How about this? Wanna go catch a movie? I got one in mind that'll help explain some things. Oh, that sounds like fun. I'd love to. A. 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 O. S. The well-dressed man at the head of a room, full of similarly dressed people tugged on his blazer, as if to signal the end of the meeting. But I think it's time we all go our separate ways. Where the fuck do you think you're going? A woman shouted from far down the long table. We're in this together. No. The man replied flatly, while backing his chair up slightly. No, we are not. I told you. I told all of you. If we fuck with these aliens who have God knows what kind of weapons, we're all gonna regret it. But what did you do? You overruled my vote and threw this whole damn company away. Damn it, Charleston. Who do you think you are? A much older man called from near the head of the table. If your father were alive to see your insolence, a pair of hands burst down on the conference table with such a force that everyone froze in place. The young corporate executive, the son of the architect behind the massive corporate merger, which resulted in the formation of Starnet, was now standing with his hands pressed firmly against the table while everyone looked at him with shock. The silence continued as he stared down each and every person seated at the table, though several of the chairs were empty, their normal occupants already in Tunisian aid custody. There were enough faces that it took several seconds to catch everyone's eyes before anyone else could break the silence. Charleston Hancock let the other board members know exactly how he felt. I'm glad my father is dead so he didn't have to see you idiots burn this company t to the ground. The response was furious in both tone and expression before calming slightly. That Martian professor offered us the keys to the future and you thought you could steal them from him. The greed, greed scoffed another voice. You're one to talk. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm a greedy son of a bitch, just like the rest of you. His tone had become almost mocking as he slowly stood up and straightened his tie and blazer. But I don't let my greed cloud my judgment. You morons really thought you could just send an army of lawyers against an alien military fleet capable of FDL and win. What the hell are you trying to say? An angry voice shouted. As it seemed, the man was getting ready to leave the room. That I surrendered. Charleston replied with a nonchalant smile. With a flash, the light that was once concentrated around the long conference table expanded to reveal the wide, well-decorated room and several figures wearing advanced combat armor standing near the door. There was a second of panic as every person at the table went to stand at once, before one of the figures by the door raised a hand and slowly patted it down to indicate for them to remain seated. Though the fear in the room could have taken a life of its own, the board members slowly looked between each and began sitting back down. It was clear that there was no escape from the consequences of their actions, and they felt it in their souls. A few of the faces were angry, a few were despondent, but all turned towards the head of the table to stare at the still standing man. You sold us out, one of them asked in a meek tone. I mean, yes. But also, the standing man started lightly laughing, casually wiped one hand across his face, and rested the other on his hip. I'm not getting out of this either. Like I said, I surrendered. I just didn't want a bloodbath on this station if any of you idiot tried to resist. What's gonna happen to us? 
The woman who shouted at him earlier was now on the verge of tears. Rather than responding himself, Charleston simply made an almost defeated gesture towards the armored group standing in and around the door. As one of them stepped forward, the highly reflective metallic faceplate of their armor became transparent and revealed a tan, sharp-featured man with a wide red stripe across his eyes and face. There was no sound as the panels of the armor moved with the wearer like they were part of his body. The room fell so silent that the labored breaths of fear could be heard from some of the older individuals present. Once it was clear, all eyes were on him. The Nishne man spoke through his translator, which caused motions of his mouth to not quite align with the sounds that came from the sealed helmet. You are sapient beings of a now fully ascended species. That means you will be held to galactic community council laws and standards. The voice that came from the helmet was so authoritative and direct that no one dared question or interrupt the man. You will be taken into custody. Your crimes and degree of guilt will be evaluated by an impartial panel of legal and subject matter experts who will then work in cooperation with both your governments and our government to determine the appropriate punishment. But are you... There is a look of dread on the faces of many of the board members as one of the youngest individuals present tried to stumble out a question. Are you going to kill us? No. Ah. Oh. The armored man replied with the hint of a laugh. The death penalty is strictly reserved for only the most egregious criminals who are completely incapable of change. Every one of you here is a greedy, self-obsessed narcissist who cares far more about yourselves than anyone else. But I don't think any of you are beyond redemption. You just need to learn the error of your ways. So what? We don't know. A still somewhat defiant voice called out. Are you just going to throw us in some kind of re-education camp? Well, there was hesitation as the segmented helmet tilted up slightly, in confusion, while the translator added the appropriate context. When the man tried to give an answer, it was clear that he was struggling on how to phrase it. Yes. You will receive economic and labor-related education. You must learn why this wretched system you have helped reinforce is not only unsustainable, but has some truly horrifying long-term consequences. God has some truly... The man suddenly became much more certain of himself as he quickly added an important detail. However, you won't have to learn our language or anything about our culture if you don't want to. It isn't that kind of re-education. Now, any additional questions can be answered in due time. Please stand and form an orderly line. So we may safely escort you for processing where most of your questions will be answered. There was a moment of hesitation before the first person began to rise from their seat with hands held just above their waist and palm facing forward. With a surprisingly warm smile, and beckoning wave of their arm. The leader of the Nishinaabe combat squad motioned for the person to step forward. There were no restraints brought out, no barking of orders, and no direct aggression, just a pleasant gesture to approach. One by one, each of the still-sitting former board members of the communication and media giant slowly rose and started forming an orderly line. Within just a few minutes, Everyone had lined up, any and all weapons confiscated, and they were being marched towards the consequences of their actions. The Gardens of Death Worlders, Part 19, Fucking Pinkertons. Are you serious? The rage and fury in Mick's voice 
as he blurted out his questions, caught the other two men standing around the holographic table by surprise. It would be them. Those fucking tyrants. I believe our intel has listed this site as being under the control of the Constellus Securitas Corporation. The Nishnab war chief's neon green irises seemed to sparkle as he looked down at his tablet and attempted to pronounce the name of the multinational conglomerate in English. Is that incorrect? Nah, nah, that's right. The Pinkertons are one of the bastard subsidiaries of Consec. And that right there. Mick leaned forward across the round display table and pointed to the target location on the projected map. That's their headquarters and primary training facility. After making the motion to point out the location, he was describing the holographic display table reacted by zooming in to show a far more detailed representation of this new target, rather than the seemingly endless morass of concrete and industrial buildings of the Yuhi headquarters, this site was secluded in the remains of a nature preserve, had far fewer large structures, and featured what were quite obviously training ground, and lots of antiquated early 22nd century defense systems. Having seen reports about this place in the past, Mick was slightly taken by the 150 years old military equipment being flagged and displayed by the holographic table. Looking closer at the hologram, he began to see shapes and figures moving around on its surface. As he peered even deeper, he realized that this wasn't just a static map, it was a live feed of the target in real time. A target which was currently deploying every defensive system they could get their hands on. Well, whoever they are, they tried to attack some of our aid workers. Tense interjected with a hint of well-controlled anger. That's something an Arnhelian or Chigagorian would do. Even Bandari aren't that shitty. Yeah, I don't know what any of those are. But fuck the Pinkertons. If you're trying to help out the workers, they'll take it personally. Though the Martian was still quite angry. He slowly started to follow Tenz's lead to control himself. But I gotta ask, how the hell did they even manage an attack? I thought Mazer and Gabriel had everything under control. I would barely consider it an attack. Their assault force was destroyed as soon as they attempted to engage us and we suffered no losses. The issue is that they're using some incredibly low-tech, yet well-shielded weapon systems that Mazer can't override. The war chief reached over the map and pointed out a few of the highlighted objects that seemed to be moving. In response, the map suddenly sprouted a few highly detailed holograms of large eight-wheeled trucks with massive, four-tubed missile racks. And their defenses are mobile, which makes reprisal a bit more complicated. Is 900Es mounted on an APD-8? Your orbital bombardment lasers can't track those? Having seen the destruction caused by the Quistar's assault of the Yuhi headquarters, Mick could imagine that such powerful weapons might be slow to aim. However, with his synthetic eye feeding him relevant information, he also knew the vehicles that carried the hypersonic missiles could only travel at 100 km per hour on flat roads. We can track them, yes. A slight frown was forming on the war chief's face as he continued to explain. But the wide field bombard necessary to ensure a safe insertion for our drop necks would be devastating to the local environment. So, what's your plan then? Mick asked while beginning to stroke his beard in contemplation. I don't know about the shielding and armor on your suits, but those missiles are the last generation of electro scramjets that didn't have quantum based control systems. They'll hit Mach 10, and those versions have tank mini nukes as warheads. In response to that, 
the war chief stood up straighter, his armor moving in perfect sync with his body, and he squinted at the slightly lighter-skinned bearded man, as if expecting him to already know. The advanced combat armor sculpted around the chief. Though quite similar to Tense Vuzi's armor, was far more ornate and decorated, and even showed hints of age battle damage, which reflected his experience. As he looked into the Martian's biological eye, he couldn't tell why Mick hadn't already begun boasting about the capabilities of his new toys. Suddenly a thought crossed his mind, and turned his attention towards Tens. Shoving an accusatory finger towards his fellow Nishnab warrior, the war chief half shouted with an irritated tone. You didn't ask him yet, did you? The war chief's eyes squinted so tight that the bright green was nearly invisible beneath the red paint that covered the top half of his face. I'm not asking him shit, Misko. Tense folded his arms in defiance of an officer he didn't have to answer to. I only agreed to bring him here. So you could ask him yourself. You fucking weenuck. The war chief shot back with a word that didn't translate, but was known by all three men. You want to use my mechs, don't ya? Mick interjected with a cheeky smirk. I was wondering when someone would want to borrow them again. Unreal. Mech. Nesko repeated in English before switching back to Nishnabemwan and saying the word for a beaver. Mech. I see. Huh. That's kind of funny considering they are the ones who built those absurdities for you. Wan and Den, though Mick did his best to reply in the form of Nishnabemwan, he had tried to learn growing up on Mars. The looks he was getting from both the other men let him know he said something wrong. One, one. I, meaning you, can see the humor in that. There was a small but earnest smile on Tenz's face as he pointed to Mick and corrected the conjugation in just the right tone to not trigger the translator in his friend's ear. Then, with a circular motion, with his hand to include all three men, he used a different conjugation, but in the same tone. Wan and Danman. We, including you, can see the humor in that. But you're close enough. At least you know the right base word. Honestly, after reading through some of the history your ancestors went through. Despite the slight smile that had sprouted on Nesco's face, there was a deep sadness in his eyes. I'm just happy to hear any familiar words. Ah, nah, I'm an idiot when it comes to languages. Mick plainly admitted, there's actually a lot of people back on Mars and Earth who are completely fluent. I'm just way better at numbers and engineering than words and conjugations. Speaking of engineering, how did you even think up these ridiculous machines my Kaimayak advisors told me you already have nearly viable templates ready to go. The war chief made a few motions with his hands over the display table to bring up a holographic representation of the latest and greatest model of mech he had access to, and a representation of one of Mick's suits. I don't even think it's fair to call those walkers since they not only run, they can even fly. Though the holographic representations of the two mechanized walker suits were less than hue scale and looked vaguely similar, the differences between them were still striking. The BD-6Es of the Nishnab, currently utilized, were relatively boxy. Featured a large, headless torso covered in armor panels and just barely broke five meters in height, excluding any shoulder-mounted weapons. Mix Mex though obviously derived from the same chassis, had slightly lengthened limb proportions and larger, smoother armor panels, which caused the machine to appear both larger and sleek. However, 
the single biggest improvement upon the standard design was the pair of wing-like ion thruster arrays mounted to the back. Yeah, I loved your guys' idea of orbital drop mechs and reusable landing thrusters. A toothy grin formed across Mick's face as he realized he now had an opportunity to talk about his new toys. But I wanted it all in one package. Turns out the hardest part was finding uses for all the power from the antimatter catalyzed fusion reactors. If I didn't have them triple up the shield projectors, there wouldn't be enough power draw on the reactors to keep them stable. That's one way to solve power management. Nesco scoffed while rolling his eyes in a sarcastic yet friendly manner. Just overpower the suit to the point where you just need to keep adding shit so it doesn't explode. They got enough shielding to resist atomics? According to those beaver dudes, it'll shrug off a concentrated 500 kiloton blast to the face. The man's tooth grin became almost diabolical as he confidently answered the question. And we call anything above 100 a strategic nuke. It would take a pretty big one of those to overload these shields. Strategic? Tense interrupted with a somewhat concerned expression after his translator contextualized kilotons of TNT into something he was more familiar with. What kind of strategy calls for atomics bigger than 100T? Ow! Oh, may I? Mutually assured destruction, though the principle was easily understood to the two Nishnab tacticians. Their faces reflect the horror they felt upon hearing Mick's explanation. Super long story. Short. The idea is that if two opponents could completely wipe each other out before either could claim victory, it would prevent a major war from ever breaking out. Well, at least y'all handled that better than the Arnhelians. Nesco replied, while gently rubbing the bridge of his nose. They glassed their own homeworld, in a war between two of their species' major factions. The ones that survived up in their early space stations were the royal fuckheads who started the war. And they've just gotten worse over time. If we had come back and found Earth glassed, Tens let his voice trail off as rage slowly started to seep through every part of his soul. Well, I'm glad y'all aren't that bad. If you want to get out some of that anger, Mick's tone had become much more serious despite the almost devilish grin on his face. Then the Pinkertons deserve every ounce of it. They were the ones who enforced the eviction of my great grandparents from their land. After the Anti-Pinkerton Act was repealed in 2175, and the U.S. disbanded all the native nations in 83, they were one of private security corporations hired by the government and other corps to force natives and other collectivized groups off their collectivized groups off their line. I don't. Sounds like you want some trophies. Both. M. Sko's tone and expression began to shift to match the clearly incensed Martian. So I take it you would be willing to let my team utilize your suits for this reprisal mission. All you had to do was say that you're going to hit some tyrants and I'd happily hand you the keys. As a particular thought crossed the bearded man's mind, his grin grew even wider. But I do have one request, but it may be a bit you want to join us for this mission, huh? Tens instantly saw where his friend was going with this. Can you blame me? I had them install a sim on my ship, just so I could practice every day. Mick was giddy with excitement as he pleaded his case. I had to sit back and watch Tens's team take my babies on their maiden mission. Man, I don't want to have to sit back and watch them get used without me again. He does have more simulator time in these new mechs than anyone else. 
Tense chimed in to stick up for his friend, much to the dismay of the war chief. And he did pay several hundred million credits for them. You know simulator time isn't the same as actual combat experience. Nesco shot back at Tens before turning towards Mick. And have you even bonded to a quasi-sentient control A yet? Though Mick's translator was able to properly contextualize what Mesco had said, the Martian heard a phrase he wasn't expecting. As he had been spending more and more time with tens, he had noticed a few new conjugations and words he was unfamiliar with. Despite not being particularly good at remembering or using the right prefix or suffix, he did understand the basics of animate versus inanimate objects. As he knew the language, there was a strict dichotomy between the two word forms. An object was either animate and contained some form of spirit or connection to the spirit world, or wasn't. However, regardless of the strange conjugation, Mick clearly heard the Nishnabemwin word, machine, and spirit as part of the same compound phrase. Wait. Hold on, Neto, what? Fucking machine spirits? The almost flustered expression on Mix caused the war chief to recoil slightly in confusion. We don't really have time for a full language or cultural lesson. But it's not that traditional kind of spirit, like a pie is. Tense, began clarifying, to the relief of the war chief who didn't even know where to begin. I don't know how you heard it translated, but they aren't fully conscious like awakened AI or sapient beings. They aren't even really sentient. For all intents and purposes, they're just really advanced computer programs. Oh. So, it's like some kind of old school. AI training for self-improving algorithms? Realizing that neither of the other men would know anything about Earth's early attempts at developing AI, Mick ignored his own question and continued with a more important one. I mean, can't you just run an automated neuron oscillation sync, transpose it to a digital map, then upload that onto a quantum emulator? The small area surrounding the three men and the holographic table that stood between them fell silent for an almost awkward moment. Though the techno-babble that came out of Mick's mouth was lost on the military men he was conversing with, that was not what caused them to freeze. Tense had even thought up a snarky retort he was going to launch at his friend, but was unable to get it out before he felt the unfathomable weight fall on the area. It was as if a being of incomprehensible magnitude had heard what the Martian had just said and suddenly snapped all of their attention directly into the conversation. I am genuinely sorry about that. Mazer's voice cut in through the speakers of the table as the pressure released and faded to much more tolerable levels. But, if I may attempt to clarify, did you really mean to imply your people have developed a process which involves taking a a digital reading of the neurological interactions in a biological entity's brain, and using that as the basis for producing an artificial pseudo-consciousness? Yes. There was real hesitation in Mick's voice as he slowly answered the question from the unseen, but deeply felt digital consciousness. Okay. That's gotta be super fucking illegal, Nensko blurted out, while once again rubbing the bridge of his nose. Not necessarily. Though the lightborn AI's tone had suddenly become incredibly pleasant, Mick couldn't help but notice every light around them got a little bit brighter. Oh, but this explains so much. So very, very much. And it's giving me all kinds of ideas. I don't want to bore any of you with legal or regulatory details. I will handle all of that. Don't you worry, my friends. What's gotten you so giddy? 
having worked with Mazur regularly for quite some time, Mesco was easily able to overpower the unsettling feeling of directly interacting with this AI. I don't think I've seen you this excited since we started the DropMech program. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but... Mazur paused for a moment, though the three men could still feel their presence. Where to begin? I have a hobby where I like to. Well, it would be roughly the equivalent of breeding domesticated animals. Because of that, I have, quite literally, millions of years of personal experience creating quasi and semi sentient AIs. However, I have yet to develop a method to form entirely personalized quasi sentient AIs based on an individual biological entity's neural activity. Oh, it's just a helmet with VR goggles and a bunch of electromagnetic sensors all over it. Takes like 15 minutes to get a good scan. Mick chimed in to try to stay on the AI's good side. However, as he continued, he wasn't prepared for how much more excited the AI could get. JT, the drummer in my band, and another professor back at Kawasu, got his doctoral developing the system about seven years ago. I even volunteered for one of his implanted quantum neurosync experiments. Wait! Is that thing connected to your neocortex and limbic system a quantum communications device? Even though Mazer didn't attempt to directly interact with the device out of respect for personal privacy, Mick could still feel the AI quickly glance through his skull and into his brain. Oh, oh, that, that is giving me a wonderful idea. I don't think I like the sound of that. Despite Mick's reply being muttered under his breath, it still caused the artificial being to giggle slightly through the speakers. Oh, I think you will genuinely appreciate this one. War Chief, Nesco Pakwenish, Ten Sips. Please show our guest to the simulator room. I will have Nan meet you all there. And you too. And the rest of the drop team need to start running mission briefs in the sins. Mazer's voice become almost serene despite the somewhat serious requests. As for you, Mikhail, I have an idea that may seem crazy but will let you meet someone very special in an incredibly unique way. Uh, a. There was just enough hesitation in Mick's voice that Nan couldn't help but feel obliged, to be honest. I have no idea. The flowing metallic skin contorted in an apprehensive smile. This is totally uncharted territory. The neural interface devices Nishnabi use aren't anything like this. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen neuroquantum synchronization technology like this outside hive mind species. Will it interact right with the simulator? The concern in the Martian's voice continued to get more pronounced. Oh yes. Of that both Mazer and I are completely sure. 100% confidence. The biomechanical being tried to reassure him with a much more earnest smile. This technology is quite impressive for such an individualistic species. However, it is something my species perfected hundreds of millions of years ago. The only question is how your consciousness will interact with the digital world. This is the first time a purely organic mind will connect to Nexus. Any idea what I'm going to see in there? Though the hesitation was still slightly present, it was quickly shifting to excitement. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Nan shot him an approximation of a cheeky wink. But Espen has been quite busy. And I've even heard they've had to allocate quite a bit of space for her mind to fully blossom. Her? 
Mick's hesitation was almost completely gone now for a moment, and replaced with pride. I have a daughter? Oh. You know, one of my favorite things about your species is how attached you get to... Well, everything. The ever-shifting features on the mechanical being's face formed into a deep and genuine smile. Where most other species would see an incomprehensible consciousness. A being it ought to be feared, you see your child. It is truly beautiful. Ah, damn, I don't know what to say. Mick's half-joke was the only thing he could muster in response to a several-million-year-old being complimenting his entire species. Soon, you won't have to say anything. A mechanical hand was placed on the Martian's biological shoulder. Once the simulator system links with your neurosync, you can share with me your direct and unfettered emotions. So, you'll be in there too? Mick asked, while slightly leaning into the comforting hand on his shoulder. Of course. Eddie, I'm not letting you go through this alone. The reply came with a slight increase of pressure on the man. Now lay back and get comfortable. Mazer already has everything set up. You'll load into a waiting room, and we'll be there to get you on your way. Rather than continue putting this off, Mick simply took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and laid back into the simulator pot. Though all of his fears and concerns were still present in his mind, he tried to think about how technologically advanced the singularity species was. If Nan species really had perfected this form of technology before the dinosaur started to roam the Earth, then he figured there should be nothing to worry about. However, the all-encompassing sensation of the virtual reality simulator activating caused his anxiety to spike for just a second. Before his mind could start wandering to dark places, a bright white light flooded his vision. As Mick's eyes began to adjust and make out new shapes and figures, he couldn't help but feel like he had suddenly been transported to a new world. How are you feeling? Nan's voice suddenly popped into Mick's mind in a way that felt more like emotions than words. Slightly anxious, but quite excited. Mick didn't say those words. He felt them in his soul. This is better than I could have ever hoped for. Mazer's voice cut in. As the Martian sight was still slowly focusing on the source of the thoughts he was hearing in his mind. Your subconscious mind is already adapting and beginning to visualize the digital environment. Though Mick could feel Mazer's unbridled excitement, their once unimaginable presence felt more like any other person. As if a dam suddenly burst, the entire space around him came into clear focus, and the man found himself standing in the simulator room he knew his body was in. In front of him stood two androgynous Nishnabek, one of which seemed to have long rabbit ears jutting from the top of their head, and the other was wearing elaborate combat armor. Without needing to ask, or either introduce themselves, Mick immediately knew which was which. Though the pair looked quite peaceful and welcoming, the man couldn't help but feel. It was out of place to see two humans standing in front of him like this. Did you two choose those forms, or is this my brain playing tricks on me? Though Mick's question was more curious than concerned, the pair still felt the need to put him at ease. A mixture of both. Nan replied, with a flick of their ears. We figured it would be easier on your mental load to represent our consciousnesses in these forms. Oh, Mazer added. However, it seems your mind is even more adaptable than either of us had hoped. You are seeing us exactly as we hoped you would see us. Okay, good. The relief was obvious as the man took a tentative step forward. 
and we were in the simulator room because, again, we thought it would be easier on your mind to load into a familiar setting. Mazur answered with a considerate nod.